All right, so I guess, you know, let's get started. So with that, I would like to introduce uh, Raj Krishna Mathuri uh, as our first presenter in this series of uh, um, uh, presentations, the seminars. Uh, Raj is a senior technical staff member at IBM's uh, uh, and where he's covering data science and cognitive solutions for power systems. He is an IBM master inventor, and with that, actually, he has 180 plus patents. That's quite an impressive achievement. And he's an elected member of the IBM Academy of Technology. He has been a, a technical staff in the systems division at IBM since 2006. And um, um, as you can imagine, over this period of time, his work impacted several platforms and uh, software products and roadmaps, roadmaps for, for IBM. So he received an IBM Cognitive Systems GM Transformational Leadership Award, Best Paper Awards, Best of IBM Award, Outstanding Technical Achievements Awards, and an IBM Corporate Award. So this is a very uh, uh, distinguished list of awards that, that uh, Raj has received over the uh, uh, several of the, over the past years. And so we are actually very pleased to have him as our opening speaker for this series of events. And his topic is going to be, or his presentation is end-to-end -end issues in AI, challenges and research opportunities. And this is actually something that is very much of interest to, to the work uh, done at NCSA here because we are looking at, at similar issues and we are trying to address similar, similar topics. So, so with that, Raj, please. Uh... Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna do today is, um, you know, kind of walk you through uh, the entire AI workflow and, um, you know, try and share with you some of the challenges we face in our work and some of the work that's happening elsewhere. And, and for me, this is like the beginning of a conversation, right? Because I'm going to be in the advisory board. And, you know, so uh, I just wanted to kick off this conversation. I'm not going anywhere. So, um, you know, you guys can reach out to me. There's different ways to contact me. Of course, you could, uh, you know, uh, ask Vlad and others uh, how to get in touch with me as well. So, uh, so let's have this conversation. And I think uh, it's going to be interesting and exciting. Um, and um, so, so we'll see, you know, uh, how our conversations and different discussions will take us. But uh, that's what I, I look at. This is, this is just seeding a conversation. This is not the be all and end all on this topic, as you can imagine. Okay, for some reason, there you go. Um, so just uh, uh, as, as Vlad said, so I, I run an AI lab for IBM, and then also as part of my day job, I also have a consulting practice uh, implementing AI solutions for clients. Uh, like faculty members, we don't get two income streams. This is just part of my uh, day job that uh, along with uh, R&D work in the lab, we also uh, work uh, in the field with clients. Uh, most of my clients are in financial services, but in the past I've also worked with the hyperscales in California and China, um, you know, healthcare as well as uh, retail and web commerce. And by the way, retail and web commerce is really exciting space to be in right now. As you can imagine, the digital transformation that's happening, right? Everyone is kind of scrambling to host uh, all these users on online services. So if you've seen the newspapers about, you know, the volume of transactions happening in uh, Target and Walmart, and they're almost like exceeding even Amazon, even giving Amazon a run for its money. So a lot of exciting things happening in this space. And, but, you know, in these last six months of stay-at-home orders that were issued, right, people are talking about, you know, multiple years of digital transformation. And I can see that as well, is that, you know, the volume of credit card transactions, the volume of web transactions is, is just growing dramatically because of the way in which you know, people are buying products and things like that. So really exciting times uh, during this pandemic uh, in terms of digital transformation. Uh, so these are some of my interests here. And I, I do wanna state that I'm, I'm very interested in democratizing AI. So taking AI outside of technology and software companies into other fields. And I know that NCSA and Illinois in general is a very interested in this being able to apply it in you know agriculture uh you know various non-tech non-software fields and and then you know for example if you look at the hpc community right uh, has been successful in doing that i think that's one of the recurring themes of the supercomputing conference and for me personally to you know go into it shops and you know for the last 15 years being able to 
see IT managers now talk about MPI, talk about RDMA, talk about load latency and all these things, right? There that were mostly the regime of technical computing and, um, and, and you know, high performance computing. And now you have IT managers that have to set up these AI clusters and, and, and you know, administer these and run these. Uh, they're talking about, you know, things that, you know, we in the HPC community have been talking about for, you know, many years. And so it's really exciting. To, I would say the golden age for HPC and AI because of the digital transformation that's happening because of the pandemic and, you know, all these concepts that we invented, the technologies we invented in the HPC and supercomputing community are now becoming mainstream and, and literally, you know, becoming a household um, you know, a word or a household term. So uh, the, the, the agenda for today is quite simple. I'm gonna give you uh, um, some background on enterprise data and AI um, and, and you know, how um, you know, uh, clients or you know, businesses and banking, finance, insurance, retail are thinking about the enterprise data and AI problem. Then I'll give you my view of the industry report card. You know, given we've made such rapid strides in, uh, in AI, how is this actually touching um, you know, the, the businesses that are outside tech and software, have we made enough progress there? And then what we'll do is, you know, we'll go through each of the AI workflow stages. I'll highlight some of the challenges and, and, and then also touch upon some of the uh, uh, opportunities for future work. And then I'll conclude by talking about, uh, you know, all the stuff that we talked about in the charts and then uh, talk about some of the research opportunities. And I said, this is just the beginning of a conversation. Um, I hope to, you know, continue this at, uh, you know, in various forums and various discussions. So, uh, so the enterprise, uh, you know, businesses, uh, like I said, you know, uh, banking, finance, insurance, retail, healthcare, uh, there's a very broad diversity of uh, data sets as you can imagine. Um, and, and, you know, so there's, uh, you know, uh, personal uh, data. There's, uh, for example, if you're, if, if you're in finance or all these filings that, uh, you know, companies do quarterly filings and yearly filings, then there's, of course, you know, data coming in from satellites. You've heard about, you know, people trying to guess the volume of transactions at a, at a retailer by counting the cars, right, through satellite imagery and things like that. Uh, if you're regulated, you can, uh, you know, use all this data willy-nilly, but sometimes when you have hedge funds and businesses like that that are not necessarily regulated, they can go and act, you know, get this data from third party providers and then put that together in their analysis. Um, so a lot of these enterprise uh, businesses are regulated. And so there's, we have to be very careful in terms of, you know, how data is used. If data is collected, it has to be fair and, you know, various things like that. So if you look at enterprise data, the majority of that is structured data, right? Numeric, um, and there's also a lot of text and NLP happening and time series data is, is the basis of a lot of the sales data, right? Uh, if you look at trade data, all of that is, and then of course, you know, speech, if you do customer service and, and especially uh, businesses in the US are very services focused. So, so, so uh, uh, there's a, a good deal of investment in uh, customer service. And so sometimes you have to store up to seven to 10 years worth of, uh, you know, customer interactions. And uh, so speech is a speech and audio are key forms of data. And, and, you know, although there's been a lot of hype around, you know, IOT and things like that, right. That is kind of growing uh, slowly depending on the, on the, uh, you know, industry you're in. And, and then of course, you know, images and vision are relevant to certain industries, but not necessarily to the others. So, so the challenge here is that there's a vast area in which all this data is really stored inside these systems. Some of them are open source. I mean, some of them are proprietary relational databases from your favorite vendors. And then, you know, you build a model on one platform, you move it to a different platform. So there's all these interoperability issues because you could have, it could be trained on a big Indian platform, move to a little Indian and then vice versa. So you wanna make sure that, you know, the protobuf binary file that gets generated from a model train, um, uh, say, say you're training in TensorFlow or, or you know, you're using PyTorch and it's a pickle file, that binary format has to be able to be runnable on any platform. And, and so there's some challenges with respect to, uh, you know, training a model in one place and then dispersing it across the enterprise and then making sure that the, uh, it works and then the uh, predictions um, or the outputs of the model evaluation actually make sense. So, um, so, you know, machine learning and training in the enterprise is being deeply embedded 
into the entire stack, right? So when transactions come in, uh, for example, let's say, you know, you go to Best Buy and, and you know, you decide to buy your, you know, next, you know, next favorite TV or, or what have you, you do some, you know, you get some pre-approvals. So here what happens is that, you know, uh, the relevant um, uh, information is uh, this, this models that do in transactions inferencing as the transactions come in, right? And so all these pre-approvals and all these things that you get back within, a, uh, within, within less than a minute, um, so here what happens is that as a transaction strikes the database, right? Uh, for example, there's a, uh, um, uh, uh, it's a, you know, there's a, you know, published use case of many banks are taking every transaction. So whether you do a chat or whether there's a credit card transactions or anything, and they put everything into the data lake, right? So every transaction or every way, every channel of interaction of a user with their systems is, is put into a data lakes. Um, and, and so, uh, every interaction you can run it through, you know, any of your models, and and inferencing happens. But then, as this data is then collected into these databases, what happens is that you know you start doing operational analytics because you're looking to do, uh, you know, dynamic price optimization, especially now, right? As people are buying stuff, uh, you know, sitting at home, there's so much of this uh, online transactions happening. So you want to do an anom anomaly deduction, dynamic price optimization. All these things happen on fresh data that's arriving into the enterprise. And then you have these um, you know, comprehensive analytics, which is essentially uh, you know, uh, businesses are allowed to store seven to 10 years worth of data. And then in the European Union, because of GDPR, there might be other limitations as well. And then depending on the geography, of course. So when you do historical training on models, you're looking at seven to 10 years worth of data, right? So people are building LSTMs and RNNs, you know, uh, looking at, um, you know, doing a time series uh, learning of such vast amounts of data. Um, and, and so that is, uh, you know, what we call comprehensive analytics, because you're looking at patterns over a, a long period. And, and then, you know, for example, let's say suddenly there's a credit card transaction from me at, at a Cartier uh, at a mall on Saturday, right? Uh, you know, have I ever done that in the last seven years, right? So looking at anomalies and things like that, uh, along with patterns of purchase, um, you know, if, if, if I shop closer to Black Friday or shop closer to uh, to the holidays, right, uh, are, are my patterns suddenly, uh, you know, out of whack? How do I make uh, any de decisions on that? So these models are, you know, getting embedded really deeply into the data stores themselves. And sometimes calling out to an accelerator is prohibitive because you have to maintain those transaction rates at a tail latency, right? So you're, you're looking 100K, 500K trans a second, and then add 99 percentile tail latency, which could be less than a millisecond. So, it, so if you have to call out to an accelerator sitting on the IOBS and get back an answer, that could be prohibitive. So, so a, a lot of designers are doing inferencing model evaluation directly on the CPUs and going out to an accelerator and back can be very, very complicated. And, and, and you, know, you want these transactions and everything to be resilient. So you, know, so you have to think about restart and recovery. So if I make a call out to an accelerator and then let's say something happens during that call, right? Uh, how, how can I ensure that, you know, you can go and replicate, you know, three different accelerators and, and, and send out, you know, three requests that's just prohibitive at the scale at which you're doing these operations. So, so there's uh, interesting ways in which model eva evaluation happens. CPUs are really the way in which a lot of the inferencing is happening because, you know, calling out to accelerators. So you, you'll see now, uh, you know, people who are making servers in the enterprise space pack a lot of accelerators that are close to the traditional uh, control flow uh, silicon uh, because you're going out to an accelerator on an IO bus or, or something that's attached to a special interconnect can be prohibitive, prohibitive because you might be able to get the throughput and transaction rates, but you also have to get the latencies and response times, right? The 99 percentile response time less than a millisecond. And remember, these stacks are pretty thick, big stacks. So you have to go through all that for all of this to make happen. I just want to um, set the stage so that you guys understand that we're talking about really complex software stacks here. So uh, essentially, how does this all work? Um, so, so let's say you get data in the form of transactions or IoT or what have you 
These are going into your enterprise data warehouses. So first data arrives in what's called an operational store. So this is your fresh data, right? And then, you know, at the end of the day or end of the week or at some certain frequency, you put this inside a data warehouse, right? And then over time, some of the data from the data warehouse it goes to the specialized databases. So if you have documents that go into a document store, a key value store, if you have graphical information about saying the members in a household, you know, that could go into a graph DB or a graphical database. And then of course, you know, the data lake, um, you know, uh, is in terms of Hadoop is also very popular to be able to store things in, um, you know, a key value format and be able to access it using SQL queries um, so, and, and things like that that make it, and you know, that people have been, you know, trying to do over the years. And then of course, you know, the data that's inside the databases sometimes moves over to an AI grid. So this is where I was talking about, right? Uh, IT managers uh, building an AI practice within their organizations. And this is where they're, you know, building, you know, uh, low latency, RDMA based uh, clusters, right? Rocky, InfiniBand, what have you, to be able to do distributed training, uh, be able to run, various, you know, data science jobs at scale. And, you know, you, you could have large banks with 500,000, several thousand data scientists that are, you know, running jobs, you know, on this cluster and the data is regulated. So they can't just go and use a cloud to be able to do many things. They might use a cloud native architecture in a private cloud in-house, but uh, going out to the public cloud and training these models when your data is regulated, you know, is kind of hard. Um, Okay, so, so let's now switch gears a little bit and then get, I'll give you my view of where the industry is at with respect to AI because there's a lot of you know, hype uh, surrounding AI as you can imagine, right? And, and so all these, the cheerleaders of AI, um, you, you know, uh, have uh, are very excited about the potential of it. And, and, and so there has been, um, you know, uh, a, a lot of uh, hype surrounding it. So I just kind of want to uh, level set, you know, where we stand in, front, in, in terms of AI. So, so, so what's here uh, is that on the, uh, this is the data set here is called the switchboard data set. This is a speech transcription data set. Um, and on the Y axis is the word error rate. So the lower the rate, you know, the better you're doing. Uh, there I've kind of marked the, the human level. And then, you know, I think this data set was created like in the early nineties, as you can imagine. Um, you know, during the days when, you know, telephony and, and all that were, uh, you know, people were investing a lot. There were call centers in the U.S. And, and you know, I, I've been told that a lot of the call centers were actually in the Midwest because it's very easy to understand Midwestern accents um, and things like that. So, so the initial benefits, uh, you know, that we got were from improved adaptation, right? Because a lot of these models are based on a single speaker. And because you're now able to recognize uh, different speakers because this data set has 2400 conversations two-way conversations you know between people right so speaker adaptation helped you know the initial and by the way the log scale is uh, uh, the, the y-axis is a log scale then HMM training was essentially used to uh, for the cost functions that are you know associated with phonemes so if you're uh, if you've done any work in speech and signal processing um, you sort of uh, understand how those, uh, the cost functions are associated with phonemes, but the next stage of yeah, you know, evolution. And then you can see the exponential impact of deep learning, right? So by uh, applying deep learning onto it, especially mixed models, you know, uh, LSTMs and RNN sequence models, along with CNNs that uh, be able to do feature extraction. And then of course, you know, some of the, uh, you know, uh, the newer state of the art that uh, you're familiar with in the literature, uh, some of the acoustic and, and wave models have been applied to this as well. So we've been able to achieve uh, human capability already um, in, in this problem, right? So, so this is a skill that, you know, AI ha AIs have been able to perfect. And then, you know, for example, sometimes, you know, when I'm, when I'm using Google, you know, I could be in a crowded place and sometimes even my wife can't understand what I said, what my mumble is, but, you know, these AIs can, you know, pick up my mumble and they learn the way I say things. And, and it's quite remarkable how advanced uh, some of these speech recognition systems have become. So now for the next set of, uh, uh, you know, skills, I'm going to uh, cite the, uh, the artificial intelligence index. And, and uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. This is work uh, coming out of uh, Fefe Lee Center at Stanford, uh, the human um, you know, interaction um, and uh, awareness lab. So 
so everyone knows about you know ImageNet and Vision AI and and you know uh, the revolution that happened in 2012. You know, within three years, right, AI was able to exceed human performance. In fact, it became so good that in 2017 the challenge was kind of discontinued. Um, and then, you know, and then NLP and uh, NLU had its own ImageNet moment, right, in the last couple of years. So, uh, so in 2019, uh, you know, somewhere around that April of last year, we sort of had our ImageNet moment where uh, for, for NLP, NLU in this glue benchmark, you know, for sentence pairs, we exceeded human performance, right? So incredible, um, um, you know, achievement there. So, uh, so NLP had its own ImageNet moment uh, last year. And then for question and answer, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the squad, uh, you know, uh, benchmarks and challenges. And here too, both on the squad one and the squad two, we've exceeded human performance. But then let's now look at reasoning. So reasoning is kind of a uh, very interesting problem that I'm very passionate about. And so last year, right around uh, July, we we were at 67.7%. Uh, and now within six months, right, we've come, you know, close to 80%, so almost a 20% improvement in performance, right, just in a matter of six months. So for those who are not familiar with this uh, ARC reasoning challenge, so there's a knowledge base or a corpus, and then there are questions which are grade school science questions. The questions are based in such a way that the word retrieval and word co-occurrence questions, right, where you can simply go and search for words and get an answer, those have been removed. So you have to do real reasoning to come up with an answer, right? And, and we're making very good strides uh, in this as well. Of course, a human uh, you know, can achieve 100% uh, you know, accuracy with this. And so, so we still have to do more work there. But, uh, if you kind of look at uh, the leaderboard and, uh, you know, the leader on the board, uh, in fact, so this was a, a student who did his master's thesis uh, from the Technical University of Bucharest, and he essentially did transfer learning on a bunch of models. So, so, you, you, so it, it's, it's, you know, you don't need fancy infrastructure and big labs and, and 10, 20, 30 scientists, but we've come, we've been able to take AI to this form where you can take existing models, do some transfer learning and some optimization and be able to achieve SOTA results, right? State of the art results with this. So, 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 so we're really good at these skills, right? And, and then, so then, then why is this happening in industry? So when we go and survey, uh, you know, execs and, you know, um, uh, uh, a lot of industries, what we see is that less than half have an AI strategy in place, right? About 20% have incorporated some amount of AI right? And less than 5% have actually extensively used AI, right? So clearly all the financial services have been hiring away academics uh, from academia to build up their labs, right? I mean, if you look at JP Morgan, it's like a university. They've got, you know, they have like weekly seminars and they've got the top academics. So people who can afford, you know, getting these skills, right? They've been able to incorporate AI in a very extensive way, right? But you know, like I said, one of my passions is democratizing AI. So we take this beyond just, uh, you know, the very tech oriented companies and, 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 you know, spread AI, you know, across a lot of industries. So we clearly have a lot of work to do here. And that's what I'm passionate about is, you know, democratizing. So this is not in just, uh, AI is not, uh, you know, uh, in the hands of just a few companies. We want, you know, the, uh, the entire community to benefit from this. So if you look at the reasons why this is the case, right? You can say, well, it's because, you know, people don't trust AI. A lot of these industries are regulated. They have to be concerned about data, silos, GDPR, uh, the European Union's GDPRs, you know, uh, uh, global companies have to follow that. Um, so, so what happens is that, you know, so you can cite all these different reasons, but um, is this something more fundamental to a business problem? What if we try and think about that in that way? So, so what I've done here on the next chart is, taken some of the skills that AI has been really, really good at, and then trying to analyze when you look at business problems, what really happens, right? So let's take the first thing, which is a large label data set, right? So, so you know, supervised learning is, 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 is why, you know, we have so much attraction in AI. So, um, so and you, you probably know this, that, you know, the lack of these uh, uh, label data sets is, is a big problem for industry uh, because of the fact that, you know, it, it's not like uh, image, data sets where, you know, you can go and have an app and get a, you know, thousand people to go and start, you know, labeling your data sets or go to Amazon Mechanical Turk, right? A lot of this is regulated data and proprietary data. So you can just hire, you know, uh, squadrons of people 
to go and label that data, although in some cases, some of that is possible. Um, so if you look at large label data sets, clearly in the industry, having access to those large label data sets isn't really there. And, and so that's, so with the skills, there's been, you know, there's a lot of these label data sets that researchers have, uh, have, have, you know, put together. But when you're looking uh, at, you know, a lot of the business problems, they're not there. And by the way, the color code is green is the easiest. And, you know, as you go towards orange or dark or orange, that becomes harder to get. Now, in terms of observability, right? So if you look at something like a poker where, you know, if you're playing cards, you, you can't see anyone else's hand. So it becomes harder to get, you know, full uh, observability from a control theoretic viewpoint. But in a business problem, that's the same case too. You don't know what your competitors are doing. You don't know, you know, how the market conditions are going to be like. So all the relevant information is not known. And this is also, you know, a hard orange. Then what about independent problems? You know, there's always dependencies between different actions and events uh, that happen, um, right, in business. And these are not like fully embarrassingly parallel independent problems that are running. And in some cases, uh, you can see that with some of these skills and games, you know, they are independent problems. But in business, there's, you know, this time, the space and time over which you have to execute. And so we don't really have access, you know, so, so there's a lot of dependencies that have to be worked out, right? And, and the fourth dimension there is simulation models, right? Do I know the results of a possible decision? And, in, and, and this too, if you don't have a close form solution, right? Some of these, uh, for example, like in the Jeopardy case, right? There could be different ways in which you can answer. But, um, and, but if you, in some cases in business, you don't really have a close form solution. Uh, so in that case as well, that's hard orange. So along with the skills and trust issues that AI has, right? And the complexity, this fundamentally business is a hard problem to solve when it comes to AI because of the way in which we're doing our AI these days with you know, supervised learning and also the information theoretic associations with business problems. All right, but there is good news. So I don't wanna leave you with this doom and gloom that you know, uh, you know, less than 5% extensively using it. If you look at, you know, it's almost like a, a Moore's law style growth, right? It's exponentially growing. The, the number of projects that, you know, the investments that people are doing, uh, the, the growth of citizen data scientists, right? Business, uh, you know, we're building these automatic tools so that we take the expertise of a data scientist and put it into the tool so you can automatically, even a business user can start, you know, uh, you know using AI, do some data cleaning and, and things like that, right? So we're making things easier to use. So the, the number of uh, AI projects is growing at an exponential rate, and that is good news. Okay, so I think I've kind of now set the stage and kind of level set everyone. And, and, you know, some of this is probably not new to some of you guys, but I just wanted to give you some context in terms of, you know, how, uh, you know, AI is kind of flourishing in the industry. And, you know, the, the deep learning revolution, right, in 2012, you know, the, 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 the big news from ImageNet did create, you know, so much of interest and excitement um, you know, around AI, right? And if you really look at industry, uh, not everyone has been able to tap into the benefits of deep learning because they very, find it very hard to apply deep learning. Even if you look at some of the time series uh, data sets and the models that are being built, they're very small models, you know, three, four, five, six layers because, you know, you have to be able to explain these models. And especially when you start having non-linear models, right, where they're black box and you can explain them. So building these 150, 200 layers and then, you know, so what we see is that risk compliance and these kind of use cases where, you know, if, you, if you're able to go find a bad guy, the regulators are not going to necessarily ask you why it came up with an answer. In fact, what we notice is that black box model, models like deep learning are being used in addition to classical machine learning models to kind of verify each other, right? So yes, the promise of deep learning is why a lot of industries came to AI, but in the process of trying to tap into the, the, the promise of deep learning, they're actually, uh, you know, trying to get that classical machine learning, uh, you know, uh, cleaned up, right, and do some housekeeping there. So we're taking inherently sequential serial algorithms and then parallelizing them using accelerators. And so we're really going back to, you know, the last 50 years of algorithm development and then trying to parallelize that, optimize that, put heuristics into that. So that's what's really happening. So the tip of the spear was deep learning. Uh, the, the promise of deep learning, only those 5% companies have really been able to tap into that have the skills and have been, hire, been able to hire research scientists 
uh, from academia. But uh, so what's really happening a lot more industry is taking classical machine learning, cleaning it up, cleaning up the data, and then you know start from uh, from the basics with respect to getting into AI, not just with respect to deep learning, but uh, through classical machine learning. So, um, and I think, you know, all, all of you uh, guys who work on science problems here, you know, on the call, and those who work with data, whether it's science data, governmental data, what, whatever data you work on, um, you know, many of us, we spend a lot of time looking and staring at data, right? Uh, in fact, that's like 80 to 90% of the time right, especially uh, data scientists in the industry. So if you kind of look at this loop here, right, uh, you probably heard of this, like the, the word dark data being mentioned. There was also a, a really nice blog from Lyft, the ride sharing company last year, where they talked about how they built a system just to find data in their organization, right? I mean, you, you can have metadata and things like that, but in order to be able to find the right data set uh, that you can use for doing uh, to a certain problem, you need much more sophisticated knowledge discovery uh, and so, so this is a finding the right data set itself, especially as you know, if you work in a large organization, that itself is, is an issue. Then it's feature engineering. So feature engineering, um, you, you know, as you know, this is again, a very complex problem. So not just, you know, cleaning the data, missing values, imputation and things like that, but being able to select the right features. So you get, uh, you know, a stable convergence and accuracy. And, um, and, and, and so, you know, especially in uh, enterprise uh, workloads and enterprise settings, you know, you, you know, in a Kaggle competition, you can throw more features and derive features and things like that and win the competition and get a very high accuracy. But, uh, but, but those of you who practice data science know that you know, maintaining and adding these features is very expensive. In fact, in certain organizations, adding and maintaining and feature could be millions of dollars, right? So you wanna be able to get the optimal set of features and do the right feature selection so that you can get the most, uh, the stable convergence and accuracy. And then you do transformations, encoding, uh, enrichment, augmentation, cleaning, and then you send it off to your service for training and, and serving. Um, you might have drift, the model may not match uh, your expectations. So you, you do a retrain and send it back here, right? And so this iterative loop keeps happening, you know, again and again, and the more you iterate, the better you get at. So, so uh, industry as a whole, especially startups, you'll see are investing in automating, uh, you know, various aspects of this, right? So how can you apply AI for AI, right? And so I'm, I'm sure everyone's heard of that. And, and so this is being able to, you know, clean, uh, have business users who don't have uh, the, the level of sophistication of a data scientist. In fact, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, businesses that I work with, you know, data scientists, they get their own parking spot, right? It's like yeah, their time is so valuable that, you know, they want to be able to come into work and then, uh, you know, start looking at the data right away because unless, you know, the data sets are cleaned up and, and become ready to train, you know, your, all your, uh, you know, AI grids that, are, that, are, that you have purchased, right, are just going to sit there, uh, you know, being idle. And what the interesting thing is that, you know, you might think that the 80 to 90% of time is just humans staring at the data sets. In fact, the interesting thing is like I'm showing here is that, you know, we've gone an accelerated training and made that really fast. But in enterprise data sets, you can spend up to 70% of your time in data prep, even when you remove the human interaction from the loop, right? So this is not just for training, in fact, also for inferencing. So when you're serving a model, you know, you get the raw data, you have to prep the data, train the data, normalize it, right? And feed it into your model, right? So if the model is expecting a Julian date, you don't, you know, uh, just, you know, give it a, a date time from Linux or Unix and, and then, you know, it, it's not gonna give you the right result. So you want to normalize it and give it the data in the right format. So that data prep itself for model serving can take 70% of the time. So yes, we've gone and accelerated, you know, model evaluation and, you know, model training, but now the bottlenecks up front in the data prep, right? And, and, and like I said, a lot of the data prep cannot happen on accelerators because this is in these deep enterprise stacks. So it has to happen on the CPU, right? And making a call out to an accelerator that's sitting on a different bus rather than where the rest of this enterprise software is, is completely prohibitive. So you have to uh, run it close to the data. It's prohibitive to call an accelerator. So this is an example where um, you, you know, we, we were essentially doing some batch training. Um, you know, this is like transactional data. So we, you know, to prepare those tensors, you have to do this padding, right? And this padding operations can be quite expensive. So you prep your tensors and ship it off to the Excel.
package, right? And, and so 70% of the time was in data prep. And then when you look at inferencing, is a say, you know, do you get the transaction and then you do a data prep, right? And that is a significant amount of the time because the model evaluation, just the forward pass is cheap, right? That model evaluation is cheap, but then the data prep time is, it can be quite significant. And so there's a lot of work that we have to do because, you know, these frameworks that are doing the data prep is Python, right? Python with pandas and um, a lot of this and, and a lot of the packages and the way in which things run in Python is, you know, a single thread, right? So there's a, um, a, a lot of work that, you know, we as the industry and community have to do to kind of make sure that, um, you know, we were able to accelerate uh, a lot of the data prep because when you're running these models, you know, in real time for, you know, high speed inferencing in the enterprise, where you have different SLAs and OLAs to meet. Uh, you know, so the, it's an it's a incredible challenge to be able to get this to work um, uh, right on the CPU. And then, um, you know, especially for missing values and imputation, you know, people have started looking at deep neural networks to select features. People are looking at representation learning. So I think, although it might be complex for industries to use black box models, but what we can do is use deep learning to be able to extract features and select features, right? And use that to go and then uh, do very quick, um, uh, you know, regression or, you know, uh, uh, classification with methods, right? That are more white box where you can reason about them or there's, you know, published literature with respect to explainability. So I think, uh, you know, using, even if you're not able to use deep learning, being able to use uh, various aspects of deep learning for feature selection, representation learning, you know, like in this use, use case, to be able to do imputation when you have missing values, that could be a way in which people could start using deep learning and then over time um, start building out neural networks and automate the synthesis of neural networks like I'll show you uh, a little bit later. So there's a, you know, a lot of opportunities here for system design and optimization. Like I said, right, these are based on uh, open source stacks. They're uh, you know, the, there's a, a lot of performance being left on the table. And some of the things, you know, I've listed here uh, are things that we can do with respect to, uh, you know, because it's memory and compute intensive and being able to, uh, you know, uh, take the data that's sitting inside these various data storage formats, bringing them up into, you know, Pandas data frames and being very, you know, efficient at that. Um, and then for example, um, you know, Onyx formats are slowly getting popular in the industry because this is a way by which, you know, you can, train in TensorFlow or PyTorch and then generate uh, a model that is, uh, you know, sort of framework agnostic and be able to run that. Um, um, and, you know, the Onyx uh, spec and standard is evolving, but we want to make sure that it's not just a graph of operators for uh, representing the neural net or the model, uh, but also there's operators to do data prep uh, as well, right? And, and so there's been a lot of industry focus and community focus around, you know, model training um, and then model inferencing and evaluation, but we should also look at, uh, you know, operators to do data prep and do that much more efficiently and, and look across the stack when we're doing, um, you know, things like that. Um, so we're also uh, in this paper, for example, this is some work that we have done where we have taken uh, reinforcement learning and then applied that to the feature engineering problem. We have some, uh, you know, promising results. So as you can imagine, you know, you can set up, you can, you know, add features, do, uh, you know, uh, run various experiments um, and do some pruning branch and bound style uh, to be able to get the right set of features and then do some reinforcement learning using cost functions. So again, this is take, you know, using AI and applying it to problems where um, you actually, you know, have to learn um, and, and do, you know, so simulated annealing style learning in a much more, you know, careful, careful way. So uh, we can use, uh, you know, techniques from uh, reinforcement learning to this problem. Um, you can take a look at the paper for details. Um, so, so, the, so when you look at the AI data lifecycle management, there's a lot of things that we have to do in our systems. And, and you know, these are investments that, you know, various uh, system builders are doing in the industry, uh, looking across memory, compute, and IO, right? Because, uh, uh, you know, you're trying to reduce the movement of data. You're bringing models closer to the data, but there's data movement that's happening within the system itself. You want to be able to minimize that. If you can minimize that, you want to be able to provide ample bandwidth, right? So that you can 
um, you know, look at these problems and do that in a much more sophisticated way. So this requires orchestration across compute memory and IO. So you need the right comp workload managers be able to, uh, you know, specify qualities of service at the application level and, and then be able to reserve uh, resources um, you know, inside uh, the, the hardware system. So the hardware structures as well as the workload managers have all have to work in tandem for this to happen. If you look at a lot of the uh, neural nets and the models that uh, folks are running and when they run their accelerator, the resource utilization of these accelerators is very small because most of the models in, in, in the enterprise space tend to be very small. So you want to be able to pack a lot of these jobs and because, you know, let's say you spend you know, $10,000 on an accelerator, clearly, you know, using 10% of the accelerator, you know, doesn't make sense. You want to be able to pack enough users as many jobs so that you get the most bang for your buck uh, from your accelerator. And so there's several things we need to do here so that, you know, uh, so you, you can prove that the investment that you made in your infrastructure is actually something that the organization will benefit from. And uh, in addition to some of the things that we have to improve in terms of the efficiency um, as well. So the, the other aspect I want to kind of hit upon is, uh, you know, I talked about this auto AI, right? So being able to uh, make data scientists more productive, uh, allowing business users and citizen data scientists, if you will, to be also uh, leverage the promise of AI. So some work we've done there is, for example, in this paper um, is uh, sort of the, uh, almost like a tournament style uh, model selection, right? Where uh, you essentially, uh, test these uh, estimators using small subsets of the data. You grow the subset size uh, gradually, um, typo there, uh, but then you compare against how these are doing and, and then you can pick the right model, right? So this kind of, you know, incremental approach. So uh, we apply this to some data sets and then, you know, the allocation, this is like the memory size. So, you know, this notion of relaxing computational requirements, right? Has sort of come from the HPC space, right? People are now beginning to kind of do that. People are even thinking about, you know, why do I have to run this code as a double precision flops code? Can I use mixed precision and things like that? Right? So this notion of relaxing computation, you know, ha has started uh, in the, you know, supercomputing um, uh, space for, for a while now. And so this is what we're uh, attempting to kind of do there, right? So if I can get good enough accuracy by not doing you know, all the iterations I need to approach convergence. Is that good enough? So here you can see um, that, that, you know, by uh, essentially, um, you know, reducing the number of iterations um, and, and, and then, you know, essentially uh, reducing the, uh, the, the time um, uh, by almost a factor of 10, you, you see that the, the change in losses is, is, is almost zero, right? And in some cases, when you reduce the number of iterations and you get a speed up in terms of, you know, uh, uh, the time it takes to do these iterations where it's good enough, right? And the change in losses is, is not too bad. So this is something that, uh, you know, um, that's emerged in the HPC space now coming into uh, the, mar you know, uh, into AI as well that we can look at where we uh, uh, essentially, uh, you know, train models not to convergence all the time, but, but try and find a cost function that essentially says that, you know, this is good enough and now I can really use this for my, for my next stage in the pipeline. So can I go and do that? Um, and then, you know, uh, similarly with hyper, opti hyper performance optimization um, as well, you can use similar techniques like this where you can use uh, techniques from, you know, uh, the optimization, uh, you know, applied to uh, hyperparameter optimization itself. And, and those of you who work with neural nets know that, you know, uh, we spend a lot of time doing, you know, running experiments, right, that run for days, uh, sometimes weeks to do the right set of hyperparameter optimization and techniques from, uh, you know, uh, genetic algorithms, evolutionary algorithms, all are being brought to the space. So you can uh, reduce uh, the, for the search space, the number of total number of experiments you have to run. And even when you're running these experiments, can you exit out of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the search uh, experiment quickly because you know that it's not going to yield positive results, right? And so this is uh, some, some work that uh, has been done as well. So this, this is kind of interesting. So this work we're doing here is what we call neural network synthesis. And the idea here is that look at the data and be able to uh, synthesize a neural network. The idea is essentially not very new. There's been a lot of work around that. We have some, you know, promising results. So we use an evolutionary algorithm to do that. So you start from 
you know, a, a small graph and then add nodes and grow this, uh, you know, over time, this kind of neural cell evolution. And so these techniques are not new. We're just applying it to this space and we're seeing some really good results. So what, for example, um, you know, an MNIST, if you have, you know, a really, um, you know, hand tuned a network, uh, right, you can get a 99 point, you know, 7% accuracy, right? And that probably take, took you days to do that um, in a fraction of the time. For example, uh, you know, by using such synthesis, you can get, uh, uh, you know, reasonably similar accuracy. And similarly, for example, in the, the CIFAR 10 case, um, you know, you get lower accuracy, less than 96, but not too, you know, far. So if you're, if that accuracy for you is acceptable, you can then, you know, do that in 1.6 hours rather than, you know, uh, the, the days it took to essentially hand code a neural net from scratch. So this neural net synthesis technique using genetic and evolutionary algorithms. In fact, what we did here was we use the algorithms that we use for our chip synthesis. So we have, you know, so we have a behavioral specification of our chip and then we synthesize. We actually took our VLSI algorithms from a chip synthesis world and reapplied them to neural network synthesis. And, and we got some really very interesting results and there's a bunch of publications on that as well. So let's now um, sort of uh, uh, you know, switch gears a little bit and talk about AI governance. And this is kind of very key to the enterprise uh, world. Um, so, so, so the AI lifecycle, right? So you train models on the public or private cloud, and then you bring it onto the enterprise server. The enterprise server is a trusted resource. So the hypervisor is trusted, the VMs are trusted, everything here is trusted. And so clearly when you bring a model in from elsewhere, you have to worry about uh, you know, can anyone tamper with the contents of the model? And then as you know, you know, when a model has to be served, it, it, there's a Python or Java wrapper around that model, right? That's doing the, the data prep and then calling. And so let's say you're running this in TensorFlow serving, it's gonna call the model. So you need the wrappers around the model and the wrapper around the model is actually going to um, look up data, right? Because you get data from the transaction, but you might have a reference table. So you might have to do a web service call or a REST API call that could be a distributed call even to pull that data in from the reference table, match it all together and then pump it into the model. So you wanna make sure that all these, uh, you know, data uh, movement that's happening is, is protected because otherwise that you cannot have your AI model inferencing weaken the level of trust of your platform. So you wanna make sure that AI that's running within the platform is not weakened in any way. So, um, and then also the model ops, right? Because once you go and deposit a model, you have to register that model inside. And, and so if you had a notion of a vault where you go and register uh, the model that you have created, and then as you get predictions out of the model, you go and uh, compensate for the drift by doing some retraining or by some other means, maybe you're not using a feature properly and, and you're able to now take some corrective action. And, and so the model ops also capturing the drift, you know, sending back events for retraining also has to be trusted and protected because if any of this is not trusted and protected, then, you know, uh, uh, you know, either a rogue insider or, you know, some other uh, rogue user could, uh, could compromise the system. And so you don't want AI models and AI serving, model serving to become the weakest link uh, in this chain. So this is uh, some of you might know from a very famous Google paper, which kind of said that, you know, the ML code aspect of AI is, you know, a small aspect, but important aspect, but there's all this other stuff around it. And then to this, you know, I would add for enterprise AI, right? Security, privacy, and governance are super key. Um, so what we're looking at is, you know, the, the core AI, if you will, we want to uh, wrap it around with characteristics of human trust. And that is very key to get, you know, uh, more traction uh, of AI, you know, in different industries, especially if you're regulated, that becomes key. And then, you know, you wanna have a life cycle for AI that you manage. Um, and so if you kind of look at AI security, right, uh, you've heard of the model inversion problem where, you know, you train a model, this is the, the, the opposite of it, where you, you use, you know, an input to the model to find out something about the data distribution. Um, and, um, you know, you have to protect the models themselves. Sometimes you might learn from privacy silos, um, like in federated learning. And then, um, you know, a malicious user might try and uh, f force a classification by forcing a label from malicious to benign, right? And there's all these attacks where people have looked at labels 
and, and confidence scores to be able to, especially if you have unlimited access, let's say I'm working with a chat bot and I have unlimited access to the chat bot and I can ask it different questions. You don't want that chat bot to reveal a social security number because yesterday, you know, the HR chat bot was trained on a spreadsheet that had social security numbers, right? So that differential privacy has to be inside the system. So now we're looking at a new layer of AI security that needs to be built and needs to be adversarially robust on top of the security uh, robustness that you put in. And then of course we have to worry about, you know, has the data been poisoned, right? Have adversarial examples been inserted into the data because, and then of course you also have to be concerned about denial of service at the AI level as well. Uh, Raj, can you please yep. try to wrap up like in about three minutes? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, so, 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 th so these are some of the things that, you know, uh, as I've mentioned before, that we have to be, you know, concerned with, and especially explainability, being able to explain why is the core of enterprise AI. And, and, and so that's why we have to be careful about what kind of models we use. And that's why, you know, we see the traction for neural nets, especially on regulated structured numeric data happening at a slow pace because uh, the, the methods for explaining black box, uh, black box methods are slowly evolving, nonlinear methods are slowly evolving over time. Um, so we've done some work where we've taken some of our toolkits and open source that. So this is actually part of the Linux Foundation. So you can take a look at these uh, toolkits. It's a, a community, you can contribute to it. And we're uh, continuously ev evolving this with uh, the community as well. Um, some, some other work here where we've looked at model ops end to end and, and, and there's a, a citation there. Um, so looking at this almost like code development CICD and applying that notion of agility and CICD also to uh, the model ops world. So Red Hat and IBM are together now, but we're two separate companies. So my friends at Red Hat, they have this uh, something called the Open Data Hub. What's interesting to me about the Open Data Hub is besides the security and governance, they have abstracted an AI library. So this AI library is not just a list of classical machine learning algorithms. It's actually microservices, a library of microservices. So when you go and serve models, as you can imagine, right, there's lots of uh, nuances, you know, is it stateful, is it stateless? And so, so th these are wrappers that are around the uh, machine learning algorithm so we can do things in a much more, uh, so, so the level of abstraction of uh, machine learning and AI is now going to the microservice level. Um, and, and so, so this is I, I, the first time I've seen an architecture that's actually looked at and addressed that problem. And I think this is going to be very, very exciting is uh, looking at a library, not just a library of algorithms and methods, but looking at it as a library of microservices that use these algorithms or even actually wrap a microservice that wraps an entire workflow and being able to provide that at a higher level of abstraction to the user. So, so I, I just wanna quickly conclude now since we're out of time, uh, we're, we're looking to mix neural nets and symbolic AI, right? Connectionist and classical AI. Um, there's some work that we have done. We've gotten some um, you know, interesting results. We're trying to look at, for example, this is a funny chart uh, that showed that there was a correlation between, into, between 2000 and 2009, if you got your PhD during that time, the revenue generated by arcades and computer science doctorates, right? So there's a correlation, but that, does that mean causation? So we're interested in causation as well as reasoning in industry. And so we're beginning to take classical AI and, uh, and you know, neural nets and kind of bring, uh, mix them together. Uh, and then, you know, uh, in the last two charts, I've kind of summarized, uh, you know, some of the opportunities. Small data, we want to become good at that. We want to become good at relaxed uh, supervision. Uh, optimal computation. Right now, we're brute force thrusting algorithms into architectures and making them work. We should be matching architectures to algorithms and being more uh, efficient about it. Um, and then, um, you know, accelerators, right? Qualities of service, small jobs, secured and private AI. We're able to use homomorphic encryption to do fully homomorphic uh, inferencing, but that's a very computationally intense uh, operation. And then uh, for, the, for those of you who are familiar with the, the governmental funding space, you know, there's a lot of investment happening around lifelong learning and continuous learning. So with that, let me just end here. Sorry, I, I kind of took a few more minutes over the allocated time, but hopefully there's some uh, time for questions. Okay, let's give a, a hand to the speaker. Thanks a lot, Rash. Okay, so there was a question by Maurice Riddle, who may still be in the room. 
Maurice, if you want to ask your question. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the very broad um, insights. Very interesting. I have a question from an academic point of view to industry, if you want. Uh, when I think about data science programs we develop here in Europe more and more, and what would be the skills you miss usually at EBM or basically where you think that should be more teached at universities to be better prepared for industry? Right, right, right. So that, that, that I think is a great question. So, so I think, <clears throat> you know, I, I would say the, the, one of the first key things is, you know, being able to work on real data sets, right? So the work, work we do in the industry uh, around open data and, and in the community around open data and open data sets and being able to, um, you know, have students work on real open data sets, I think is, uh, you know, very, very key. That I would say number one. And of course that requires, you know, community wide adoption because working on these toy Kaggle data sets and things like that, they don't really, uh, you know, give people the background to be able to work on real problems. Then the number two, I would say is that, you know, data science, as you know, is a very interdisciplinary. Uh, and, and usually what I see is that, you know, depending on where you came from, uh, right? So there's people who are computer scientists who get into AI. So they, they, their backgrounds in parallel systems, but they don't know too much about, you know, um, uh, you know, they don't have much domain knowledge, right? So equipping students with the domain knowledge, because, you know, a lot of data science is an art and a science, right? So being able to get them, you know, some amount of domain knowledge, right? There is some black magic and black art associated with this. Um, uh, I think that is also key. And then, um, and, and the third, I would say is that, you know, the ability to look and uh, across the stack, because to get data science to really work, uh, like I said, right, I'm going into IT organizations now and people are talking about, and, you know, these folks never talked about threat parallelization and MPI and, you know, RDMA ever before, right? And suddenly because of AI, they're now talking about these advanced concepts. And so being able to reason and look at things across the stack, so you're able to uh, understand model performance in terms of a data science viewpoint, and then also uh, reason about systems performance and look at across the stack and understand why there's a bottleneck and there's a choke point. I think that is going to be very key. So since the space is so interdisciplinary, you have to be, you know, uh, an expert at one thing, uh, almost like a T where you have breadth in a bunch of areas. And then of course, you know, we want people to be strong in one or two areas. So I think, um, you know, skills that are like a T, I think are going to be very critical to succeed in this space. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. One final question. Anyone? Go ahead. So I have one question for you, Raj. Um, what are some of the mechanisms that you have in IBM to try to engage uh, younger practitioners, like students or maybe postdocs who want to, for example, spend a summer working with IBM or to try to engage the community to be more proactive to maximize the use of uh, your products? What mechanisms do you have for that? Right. Yeah. So, so in, you know, uh, you know, one of these things that's popular in the industry now is like these residencies, right? And so, for example, I think Apple just recently announced a residency. So we've been doing these residencies from time to time where, you know, students can come in and, you know, work on problems and things like that. Um, there's, uh, you know, besides just the internships and co-ops and, 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 you know, various things like that, um, you know, we're also, um, uh, you know, doing these apprenticeships. Uh, for example, you might have someone like in a different background that can, you know, come in and work with IBM for a year and then, uh, you know, get exposed to different domains and different problems um, and then become, you know, skilled in a domain. Uh, so we're doing that as well. Um, so I, th I would say the apprenticeships, uh, um, you know, along with uh, so residencies are the new ways in which we're, uh, you know, interacting with these students. In fact, even during the pandemic, right, we are you know, having uh, as like a lot of other companies, you know, remote internships and things like that. So, so I think, you know, if you really work, want to work on real data, you definitely want to come to industry because, you know, AI is about data, right? Yeah, yeah we're, we spoke a lot about things here. Uh, uh, so I don't have to tell this group is that, you know, at, at the end of it all, it's about data. So the more you work on real data and get exposed to real data, that's, that's how you become, you know, better at AI. Okay, well, thank you very much, Raj. That was a very informative, very interesting presentation. I think with that we will, we will end today's seminar. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you for the so opportunity. We will reconnect next week.
Yep, we will.